everybody. Watch it. Anyways. <laughs> One of those guys. There's no accounting for taste, is there? For audiences, they're useless. Hi, Reese. Thank Hello. you so much for putting that together. <laughs> uh, yeah, no worries. That was incredible. Um, so, just to give you everyone a little bit of background on Reese. Um, besides being born in Wales and actually went to school in Dublin, he spent the last 11 years, is that right, at SNL? Uh, yes. Then? I, I think it's 11, it might be 12. I well, don't, okay. Yeah. Great, he spent the last 12 years at SNL, because um, we have a lot of students in the room, I wanted to give a little bit of your history there. Mm -hmm. So correct me if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. you went in as um, part of the film unit over there, mm -hmm. and then became a line producer? Well, I was uh, I was just an office PA, a lowly office PA, uh, for uh, a season, and then slowly started lying about my experience and climbing the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> Is that something you recommend? Lie about your experience? Absolutely. If you know, you gotta you gotta work for it. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you've been at SNL now for twelve years, and now you're a film director and have done over a hundred SNL shorts. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Right. And you did the title sequence to the 40th anniversary. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. So how did this whole whole thing come together? How did you get together with Fred and Seth and pull the whole thing off? Uh, so I've known Bill, Fred, and Seth at SNL and, and worked uh, with them on a lot of uh, shorts over the years. And But in their final season, I think well, it was at least Bill and Fred's final season, uh, it might have been their penultimate show, we did a piece called History of Punk, which was a, uh, a short little mini documentary about a Thatcherite punk artist called Ian Rubbish. Uh, and, and within it, we, it, we only had a, a day to shoot it, but we shot sort of fake concert footage, and we did a fake British talk show, and um, contemporary interviews with the band sort of as they are now. And we, we interviewed Steve Jones from The Pistols, and, and basically, built out this little mini documentary and, and basically had a, a good time doing it. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, when, when those guys left and were looking for something else to do, um, that came up and... Uh, you kind of pitched this idea to them or you just kind of... No, it was yeah. there. It was actually they, I, I think, because um, Fred has a relationship with IFC and so, you know, through Portlandia, obviously. And yeah. um, so I think actually they saw that piece that we'd done, I, IFC, that uh, being they, and uh, actually approached um, Broadway Video, who produced Portlandia, with the idea at the same time that Seth, Bill, and Fred were also calling up Broadway Video, saying we think this could be a show. So it was sort of a, a perfect came together. Um, yeah, perfect thing. So did someone on the, out of that group really love documentary film? Oh yeah, I mean all of us do, uh, but I mean Bill Hader especially is is a, sort of an encyclopedia of film in general and documentaries. Uh, he uh, he has a very soft spot for so he's one of those guys that will make you feel stupid no matter what because it, it's you know it's that, <laughs> that sort of annoying you know have you seen this have you seen that you know and you've never he's like he'll be referencing a mini documentary in the special features of some weird reissue of you know Sullivan's Travels or something and and that's his like point so yeah he's hard to keep up with <laughs> so how did you guys hone in on so the other episodes you've done um, Sandy Passage which was a spoof on. Um, Oh gosh, the two sisters. Grey Gardens. Grey Gardens, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, drones, a spoof on Vice, mm -hmm. I'm guessing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then, oh, what was the other spoof you did? Uh, Nanook of the North, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So which, how did you come up with the documentary films that you wanted to kind of do? Is spoof the right word? What's the, what's the word I would use? Um, yeah, not really spoof. Uh, I guess pay homage to. Pay homage to, that right. Uh, yeah, it, we basically sat around for a week. We, again, we knew we wanted to do something in the documentary format. We knew we wanted to reference. Uh, we, we had all these documentaries that we all loved, and so we loved the idea of referencing them. Um, but uh, yeah, and it was funny. It was like we probably spent a few different like week long sessions almost discovering what the show was. Like it wasn't. We didn't sort of say, "Oh, we're going to do the show where we're going to reference, you know, Grey Gardens." Blah, blah, blah. That sort of came about as we started talking about it more. That that it, you know. It, that we would sort of be true to that format. And I think part of that came out of the desire to make a show that 
you know, that didn't fall into the sort of Spinal Tap Christopher Guest world, um, where it was just sort of a fake subject, and you know, and you, we were just it was just sort of handheld cameras and you know the documentary language. We wanted to, you know, to almost mislead people. So if you didn't know anything about the show and you turned it on, it might take you a good, you know, five ten minutes to figure out that it wasn't a real documentary. <laughs> It's, when you watch it, and if you're familiar with any of the other films, you can tell you've paid really close attention to the detail, from the coloring to the framing mm -hmm. to the acting and the script. Mm -hmm. So, did you? What was that process like from a creative standpoint? Watching each of these films closely. What yeah, it was. Um, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I do a very similar thing at SNL. Uh, it's kind of. It's definitely part of the training. Uh, when I started the show, we most of the film that was getting made at the show at the time was commercial parodies, um, and so sometimes you'd be referencing a specific commercial, and so. That investigative sort of process uh, was something I've definitely done a lot. And, and over the past few years, where we started doing sort of fake movie trailers and things, it's become an even more pronounced thing that we'll, you know, sort of go to those lengths to sort of really get as close as we can. So um, it's a lot of fun. And, and, and uh, Alex, so Alex and I, Alex is my co director and uh, also my longtime DP at SNL. Um, we, yeah, we, we kind of get a kick out of that stuff. and, and um, and, you know, sort of really sort of pulling apart that language and, and then doing our best to sort of find the tools. Like, it, there's a few instances where, so we, we did one that was called The Eye Doesn't Lie, it's based on the Thin Blue Line uh, by Errol Morris. And, uh, you know, you look at these films and they have a very specific look to them, uh, usually because they were shot on film uh, at a specific time when technology was a specific way. And so when you go about recreating that look, it's not an easy, you don't just flick a switch, uh, you know, in, in your uh, edit system or in the color house. It, you, it, you know, there's a number of factors that go into that. So um, in that instance, we, we dug up, we, we managed to track down the exact lenses that they shot the original interviews on. Um, and then we had a guy that actually was able to give us uh, the same grain structure of the film stock that they shot it on. Uh, uh, so yeah, there's a lot of nerdy things like that <laughs> going on in every episode. <laughs> and then how much of it is scripted and how much of it is just um, kind of whatever you call it, ad-libbing? Um, it depends on the episode. Uh, for the most part, it was pretty tightly scripted because, uh, you know, I think a misconception about, well, it's not a misconception, but, you know, it's comedy, uh, especially with these guys, a lot of people sort of think, well, it's a lot of improvised in the spot. It has a loose feeling to it, especially in the documentary format where you want it to feel loose. Mm -hmm. but. You know, we sort of discovered, you know, with a 22-minute um, episode, you can't afford to get too loose because the narrative will start slipping away. Um, so for the most part, it was pretty tight. And, you know, the, oh, those guys will always embellish and, and do something amazing. But, um, but we, we usually had a pretty good roadmap for where it would go. And it was more about finding a way to make it feel loose and, and improvised uh, was the sort of the bigger challenge. I saw so you showed a couple clips in the credits that were either deleted scenes. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have a whole sizzle reel of deleted scenes? There's a scenes? lot. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that got, got there. <laughs> uh, I, w I think we're all too lazy to put it together. <laughs> as a, but yes, it exists. Someone, If someone else would do the work, I would happily. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. if someone here would. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you guys got uh, renewed for another two seasons? Yeah. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So between the two seasons and the film that you released this summer, mm -hmm. uh, Staten Island Summer, mm -hmm. are you going to stay with SNL? Oh, that's a <laughs> uh, yes, officially. Uh, I yes, I. <laughs> <laughs> I said probably. I'd throw one uh, no, probably. I mean, it's uh, it's definitely tough doing all of these things around SNL. SNL is about forty weeks of the year, and uh, my past year uh, involved. We we sort of finished editing. We were finishing editing the movie early part of the year, so I was spending my Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays in the edit room on the movie, and then going to SNL Wednesday. Through Saturday and then and then uh, documentary. Now we actually shot during the SNL season as well. So I would sort of finish a show and then fly out to LA on the Sunday and prep as much of the week as I could and then come back. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was it's it's intense and I don't think it's sustainable for a long time. <laughs> uh, if you have a wife and kids, <laughs> and I'm guessing you do. Were, yes, I do. They weren't. They're, <laughs> um, they're patient about it. Are we going to see any other faces from SNL on the next couple seasons? Probably, um, and hopefully a lot of others too. Um, no, it's been, I mean, again, it's sort of episode, episode dependent. You know, we sort of had A.D. Bryant come into our Al Capone Festival uh, episode, and but John Slattery as well, and obviously Jack Black. Um, so that it, that's what's beautiful about the format is that each film is such a standalone um, 
thing that uh, there's an opportunity to sort of have some fun with the casting. We're not sort of married to, you know, Bill and Fred are always this. Um, the Al Capone Festival episode that we did, uh, Fred was in it in a very, very small part. It was mostly Icelandic actors, uh, and then Bill, Bill wasn't in it at all. So, um, and, and it was an enjoyable, you know, we all were just yeah. proud of that episode. As so when you're looking at the next couple of seasons, are you kind of looking at who could be in it, and then what docs they could be paired with, or how you... No, not necessarily. We start with the docs and uh, all the stories, and then, and then you kind of go from there. Um, always starting with yeah. the docs. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, all right, a couple questions I want to ask you about you. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit more about creating a short at SNL? So how does that work from ideation to all the way through broadcast? What does that look like? Uh, so essentially nothing really happens at the show um, in terms of things going into motion until Wednesday. Uh, to, well, Wednesday before the Saturday. Wednesday before Saturday. So Tuesday night, uh, We'll start with now. So tonight there was a pitch meeting uh, at the show where the writers all sit around uh, and meet the host for the first time, and they basically throw out their, uh, you know, a few ideas that they're thinking about. And, you, and it's sort of an opportunity. It's more of a meet and greet opportunity, um, but also to get a little bit of a temperature of, of what they might be into, might, what they might not be, etc. And then tomorrow night the writers will will work all night uh, writing the the. And probably we end up with maybe 40 plus scripts uh, come out of Tuesday night. Why they start nighttime and not daytime <laughs> is not a question I can answer. <laughs> uh, I think it's a hangover from a different era uh, <laughs> where narcotics may have been involved. It's actually official. So like their, start, their call time or start time for the writers is actually. I don't know if it's written down like you don't show up until this time, but it's definitely a night, a Tuesday night thing. And. Uh, so yeah, so oftentimes, sometimes when we're arriving uh, early in the morning on Wednesday to start looking at these scripts, you'll see droop, bleary-eyed writers sort of popping home for a shower. Uh, so then around late in the afternoon on Wednesday, we'll sit, all sit around a table, basically do a read-through with the host, the cast, all the writers, um, and we'll read through all 40 scripts uh, up for the show that week. And then out of that meeting, uh, Basically, I don't know, probably 12 to 15, maybe even less than that. I can't, I can't remember what the total goes into a show, but gets chosen. Uh, and so we don't really know what's going to go into the show until late Wednesday night, uh, maybe around some 9, 10 o'clock is when that decision comes down. And then uh, we will, uh, that's when we kind of spring into action and uh, do our best to sort of figure out how we can pull it off. And so we'll get our piece. Thursday morning usually involves a crazy location scout scramble. Because again, we haven't even, it's not like we have, you know, uh, a stage sitting here and, you know, this is going to, this is, you know, the perfect, we don't, the, like, we basically go out and find everything every week, no matter what. There's no sort of preset uh, things in place. Even our crew is all freelance and we, so they all come in uh, depending on the piece. And then, so yeah, Thursday is just this mad scramble, like, find the locations, find multiple locations, building sets. Uh, so our set builds, uh, they get ordered up on Wednesday night, um, yeah. so that's also like a quick decision you have to make. Uh, just to, you literally, you've had about five minutes of the script, and you have to decide quickly: is this a set? Is it a location? Is it a combination of the two? Um, what set do I want? Uh, and you design the set as quickly as possible with a production designer. Uh, you also have to pull the trigger on wardrobe and all that kind of stuff on Wednesday night. So that's a quick kind of. Um, how many people are you dealing with at this point, or how many people are on your team? A few. I have. Well, I actually. I mean, my team specifically. Uh, that at that moment, I work with a my my producer, Justice McClarty, uh is uh, sort of heads up that production side of things for me, and then I have, and then just uh, two other, uh, Melanie Bogan and Louis Lucci, sort of uh, our office staff, and so. It all, it's just them, and then, I mean, we have designers and all this kind of stuff that kind of start building up as the week goes, but um, it's them. And then, uh, and then yeah, uh, there's a rewrite happens on Thursday as well, just to make your life a little bit more difficult. <laughs> uh, so sometimes we'll, we would have scouted things and figured it out, and then you get a rewrite that's eliminated that whole thing that you spent ages trying to figure out. Um, and then uh, we all get up at about 4 a.m. on Friday, and, uh, and the day starts with... Uh, with whatever we're going to go shoot, um, and sometimes there's now you know these days there's more than one film piece a week. There's maybe three, so we're all share. There's three separate film units uh, shooting on Friday, so I might have the morning time slot to, with the host or with whoever, but then they have to leave me to go back to the studio 
to go rehearse for the live show and then they have to go back out after the live show rehearsals at around like 11 o'clock or midnight to the second shoot uh, that might be somewhere else in you know some stage in Brooklyn and so they'll be out until sort of 3 or 4 a.m. Um, it's a fairly uh, punishing experience, yeah. I think, hosting the show. <laughs> and then the editing starts Saturday morning? Uh, Saturday morning, um, yeah. M well, it depends on the piece. If we shot Friday, the, the, the best pieces these days, the one, well, for, on the post end, if we shoot Friday morning, and then that's it, we're all done Friday morning. <laughs> uh, so you can spend the, the night uh, cutting. But this last week, for example, we shot a movie trailer that we, it was basically 24 hours of shooting. We started at 5 a.m. Uh, we shot on location until um, around 5 p.m. and then moved to a stage and shot until about 4 a.m. Uh, and then, and all the while, uh, my editor Adam Epstein is actually in the room here somewhere. Um, he uh, he was sitting on set and started cutting, uh, and and then we transferred back to the office and spent all Saturday uh, editing. Yeah. Uh, there was a little bit of sleep in between. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you guys all watch it Saturday night, or you're sleeping. Uh, we no, we're there. Like we're we're still editing right up until it r plays on the show, and then sometimes we have to keep going afterwards because we use some piece of music that we weren't supposed to, <laughs> or uh, so we have to for the, for the internet, you know, because they go on online now afterwards. So sometimes if you're doing a movie trailer, you might want to use the score from that specific movie, and there's a weird thing because it's parody and because it's live television. We we have that one time grace period of the live show uh, where we can use that, but then if it's gonna go online right. we have to f so we have, usually like we'll get it onto on the show and then sit back and start making all those other changes um, yeah it's so. a pretty punishing schedule but I'm, I'm guessing you still love it it's it's uh, terrifyingly addictive uh, once you're in it it's like it's definitely brutal and and, and punishing and stressful but um, pulling the sense of achievement when you get to Saturday night and you see it play uh, it is definitely sort of outweighs, I think, the, the punishment. And um, it's, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And, and I think the sense of achievement in, in going after something that seemed impossible on Wednesday is a weird thrill that we, we uh, enjoy as well. I mean, SNL is such an incredible, it's an American institution, it's a New York institution. Um, and it's, you probably feel very lucky if you've worked hard to, to get there. Mm -hmm. How did you get your first job there, or how did you get in, and what advice would you have for anybody here looking to get in, either at SNL or whatever their dream job? Um, is? I, uh, yeah, I had a long, I mean, I got had sort of this weird, lucky circumstance of, uh, I, I was sort of, I got to New York on a whim, had no plan. Uh, I didn't go to film school, I, I studied theater. Uh, but I wanted to work in film. Um, and uh, so I came to New York not knowing what the hell I was going to do and uh, thrashed around for a little bit. But then I got a job at a, at a, a post-production company, an editing company that did commercials and as their receptionist. And that was my first full-time job in, in the city. And, uh, and then uh, within my first week, the then director of uh, SNL, uh, the film director, Jim Signorelli, came in uh, and I just, Chatted with him at, at lunchtime in the ki just a casual, you know, how are you doing? Who are you? Kind of thing. No, I, that wasn't me. He was asking me. <laughs> uh, and uh, and anyway, like two weeks after that, he randomly called me up and said, "My assistant is leaving. Do you want to come work for me?" Uh, and so I I did. And um, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I didn't really know anything about SNL to be honest with you. I mean, I knew what it was as an institution, but I did not grow up watching it. Uh, I'd seen it maybe once in the whole time I'd been in the States at oh, that wow. point. Uh, so my second time watching it was actually working there. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, it was kind of this weird uh, thing. And I, I sort of had this weird sense of reverence for a play, but, but it was all based on just, you know, knowing that this place was this crazy institution. Um, what do you think happened in that conversation? Like, what was it that you think that stuck out to him about you? Uh, I was British. <laughs> <laughs> you started uh, on the phone? <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it, you know, it's again. There's no. I, I feel terrible. Sort of. You know. There's no sort of template for. Just do this and this and this. Uh, who knows what it was? Um, and there's a lot of instances. I can. I can point to sort of a bunch of moments that, you know, in the long term became fairly significant turning points. But at the time, they were just. It was just a moment or something you didn't plan or didn't. You know. Uh, so there is no. This thing, there's no real route other than, I mean, again, like I said, lie, lie about your experience. And just, lie about your experience, yeah. lie on your resume, okay. Yeah. But then actually follow up with it. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, the thing is, like, I started as an office PA. 
uh, didn't know anything about film. My first time on a film set was my first week working there. But you know, I, it was the best place to possibly land for someone who wanted to work in film but hadn't been to film school. I, like where they were making films on a three-day turnaround every week, and so and at the time they were shooting on film as well when I started there. So uh, and and you know, I I stuck around as much as possible. I was there, and I was you know I tried to be the first person there and the last person to leave and. If I didn't know how something worked, I'd figure it out. And um, and there's a million processes sort of in, you know, in, in that go into making a film. And uh, so there was a lot to take on. But that was what was fun. And I think, you know, again, I think sticking at that. And 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 I and to be honest with you, I don't think I've ever sort of let go of that energy. Like that's what I love about um, film in particular, or even directing, is that you you know you never know it. Mm -hmm. Like it's not something you know how to do. It's I mean that's. Part of it is like I constantly feel like I don't know. Like I don't, I don't get a script and know immediately. Oh, that's one of those. I'm going to just do that. That's what's it's you know it's it's equal parts thrilling and equal parts terrifying because you have to. Yeah. It's your job to figure it out. And um, but that's the fun of it. And, and you know, it's we're in an industry that's constantly changing. From exactly. Yeah. It's, to distribution. Yeah. There's no there's no fixed way it's, to, so to you'll, do something. You'll never be an expert at it. No. Exactly. <laughs> and it's great. I like that. What about um? So I mean, you're saying there's you know there's no one piece of advice to give. Have you ever gotten any bad advice, or do you have any bad advice you wouldn't you would say don't follow this advice, or the worst tip you ever got in your career? Hmm. Uh, bad tips. I mean, it's funny. Jim Signorelli, who I worked for, was full of them. Um, <laughs> he was. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was a real old school. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say there's bad advice. I mean, I've definitely. I mean, I've met examples of what I would consider people following a bad course. Mm. Um, again, people who there are people who behave like they've made it, uh, as though making it is a thing, um, and you know, and they just kind of sit back and coast. That's a thing I wouldn't do because um, you've never made it. Uh, and uh, and there are also people who you know. I think and I'm saying this as now, assuming you guys are all students and things. It's just, no one's ever going to hand you anything. Uh, in you know, there's no no matter how well qualified you think you may be, or if even if you've you know, or or you've got connection, whatever it is. Like, there's a certain point when you have to show that you know what you're doing, mm -hmm. um, and so you can never. I've, again, I've had plenty of interns and s seen people come through the show, and the ones that the ones I feel like have either gone on to work for me or who have seen succeed are the ones that are there to to work and to learn, um, and they're, and they're very it's surprisingly few. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, there's a lot who come in and they they're like, well, I go to film school and I've made I've made five short films and you know and I, and they've got this weird energy that they know what they're doing yeah. and um, and yeah, you just don't, don't don't ever be like that. That's interesting. I mean, what you said is you don't, you've never really made it. You're always mm -hmm. trying. Someone once said to me that if you feel like you're out of your league or if you feel like you're just over your head, you're probably doing the right thing because you're pushing yourself right. the entire time. So it yeah. sounds similar to, to what you're saying. No, exactly. It's like you. Ca I mean, the thing when I said when I said I sort of lied about my experience. Yeah. It was essentially it's taking a risk, um, and again, you know, knowing that I was never going to have the experience. I, and I I knew that in myself I was never going to be confident enough to walk in and go like, yeah, I could do that, you know, in a, in a truthful way. Yep. <laughs> uh, but I, I knew that no one was going to ever hand me it at that point, you know. So so you I I basically you know kind of just put myself up there and said I'll, I can do that, and uh, and then just figured it out as as I went and. So yeah, it's and and that happened when I started producing, uh, and it happened when I started directing uh, as well. It was sort of, but again, it's like I could have crashed and burned too. If someone wanted to get in the film, would you recommend they kind of go a more traditional route, maybe shadow somebody, or is it just start making your own stuff, create a web series, put it up online? What would you, what would you, what advice would you give? I would just, you know, it's really, again, there's no fixed way. It's if. If you have the need to make something, or if you have a story that you want to do, you know, and, and you feel like you know you can do it, um, I would say do it because you're only going to learn through doing it. Um, at the same time, uh, I wouldn't. I, at the same time, I, I wouldn't sort of hold out, not you know, not take a job in film or you know whatever it is uh, because you think I know I need to have all my time to make my film. You know, like I I'm, don't know if I'm being clear, but it's like. I feel I've known a lot of people too who have, like, no, I'm not going to go and start working at that low level. You know, I'm not going to be a PA or I'm not going to be a receptionist in an editing company, whatever it is, because I'm a filmmaker and I'm going to make films. And you know, and they spend most of their time broke and uh, and begging and and you know, then maybe they make their film, but they don't know anybody, so no one, you know, nothing happens with it. 
I think it's a sort of, I think it's equal parts value to give yourself the experience of making something and have something to stand by. But at the same time, I think it's also just as, as important to, if, if you want to work in film, like find your way in somehow, sort of start getting familiar with the landscape and, um, and don't be above any, you know, sort of just, just get your foot in the door somehow. It's always better. That was always the way I took it. I was like, I never looked at any, oh, I need to work here. Like, this is the place I gotta go. It was more just, I'll just I'm gonna take a job in, again, that editing company because it was related to what I wanted to do. It wasn't exactly what I wanted to do, but I, it, I, to me, it was a step. It's getting easier and cheaper for people to produce films, produce media. You mm -hmm. can, there's a film release, shot entirely on an iPhone that was released theatrically this summer. What was that one? Uh, Tangerine. Oh, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, I actually haven't seen it yet, but it's just, it's getting easier. We're seeing more filmmakers, more media makers come out. Do you think there's going to be, sorry for the scary question, some no. sort of like film bust at some point? Because we're seeing so many media makers and so many different types of distribution, what do you think is going to happen in the next couple of years? I... I don't. I mean, I'm not a studio head, so I, no, I can't predict it. But, um, but I do feel like it's a, we're in a weird place um, where, you know, yeah, films of a certain size don't get theatrical releases anymore, um, but are finding so that therefore are finding their way in you know throughout other outlets and you know Netflix being one, mm -hmm. um, and you know it's it's I don't know where it's headed exactly. Because the weird thing about film, you know, so Staten Island Summer, for example, was a primarily released uh, through Netflix. We had a limited theatrical release, but um, we were never going to get into, the you know, that was a, a thing. It's like, you, we're never going to get a big theatrical release because we didn't have any big stars in it. Um, and, uh, you know, just the nature of the film, just we, our budget, it was what it was. And it was this weird thing that everybody's very matter of fact about it. Like, sort of, it was a given, just given the size. And, really? and you sort of have this idealistic hope that, well, you know, but surely if it's good, you know, like, yeah. you know, that's what counts. And it's like, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, so which, when you're putting together your budget and your team, are you saying, okay, we're going to go for theatrical or no, let's let's work on Netflix? No, I mean, it wasn't a, again, I, I don't tend to worry about that stuff. Uh, you know, you let for people who wear suits regularly to figure that stuff out. Um, but, you know, it's definitely a part of the conversation as, as it's going forward and, um, you know, but I think as a director, you know, for me, I would rather people see a film in the theater because uh, it's just a better experience. And most people shoot movies with that intent in mind. You know, you want to see it sort of big and, and you, you mix your sound so that it can be heard in the best possible, best possible circumstances. Um, you know, it was this weird feeling when I realized that people were going to see the film uh, at home and, uh, you know, you sort of realize, like, oh, I, I can't control what their TV does to it. Uh, or what they're listening to it through, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I don't know like what if it's a good future or a bad future. I mean, I like that there's uh, so many outlets for yeah. for these things, um, but um, I don't know. I think I grew up going to the cinema and I enjoyed that experience of of discovering things at the cinema as well. Like you know, that was the days when you know I, it was funny in Dublin. Uh, this is a real p personal thing, but. Uh, there was a cinema chain in, in Ireland that uh, you could buy a subscription card to. I think we have something similar here now. Yeah, um, but you pay pass. A, yeah, movie pass. But you pay a monthly thing and you could go see the cinema as many times as you want. And I had that all the way through college, and it was like the greatest thing ever. But it meant that I saw everything. Like I would, I would just go see shittiest movies, and the, it, you know, it's the best. But it was like this great things. You would just make these discoveries continually because of that thing of going to see it. And I and. And Netflix is now that new, um, that sort of new oh, that's environment for that. There's so many people who sort of discover whether they're obscure TV shows or you know all these weird movies that you would never dig up uh, are popping up. So that's it's, it's why good documentary thing. film, the, at least we think a big reason why people are consuming more docs and are more mm -hmm. interested in it is because of Netflix. They have a discovery tool right. for finding right. them. Yeah, and actually because of documentary now, which was for those of us that work in docs, we were super excited about because somebody was making docs cool again, <laughs> <laughs> so and fun, and hope we were hoping that people would go back and watch the films that right. uh, you guys are honoring. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. Exactly. That was part of our goal as well in, in doing it. Um, yeah. It's amazing. I mean, again, I, I know personally that I've, I've watched. Uh, so many more documentaries uh, on Netflix. It's it, you know it's it's far more fun than than most television uh, these days. So uh, well, television's actually getting pretty good. It's it's interesting oh, yeah. to see I mean, like true, but like it's interesting to see how what you know the budgets that were spent on film are now going to TV. Mm -hmm. You're seeing actors and directors going that route too. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like to work with IFC? Did you do work with 
were you, did you have a lot of creative freedom on this? Yeah, they were amazing. Uh, I don't know if it was just because, you know, Fred's relationship with them and, and, and Broadway Video, but we really did some things with the show that I don't think we would have been allowed to do anywhere else, like doing an episode that's mostly in Icelandic um, or, or even, you know, or majorities in black and white and yeah. silent. Like taking, John, taking someone like John Slattery and having, like not giving them a single line <laughs> uh, and fl like flying them to Iceland to do it as well. Uh, that's, uh, there's, you know, there's not many places that, that would let you get away with that. So, uh, no, they were amazing. We kind of went and, and they, they just let us do the show that we wanted to do. Um, yeah, it was great. So I want to make sure I'm not ignoring anybody because I can't see anyone over there. Anyone have any questions? Hi, I'm I'm Donna from Chicago, Illinois, and I was just wondering, after you know all those years working in SNL, were there any moments where you were utterly starstruck and just grappled with you know <laughs> being professional, working with your team? Uh, just um, about that. Starstruck. It's funny. I'm like the worst person for this because I I'm I'm a very uh, I rarely uh, reveal that I'm impressed with anything. <laughs> uh, but uh, there are definitely moments where, you know, I guess in, I mean, like people like Robert De Niro, uh, that, that level of actor, or, or even Alec Baldwin and stuff, that, like that's intimidating. Um, or, or like, or even Christoph Waltz or something, you know, like where you're, it's, you know, you're aware that you're, you know, you're there with a real actor that's done real things. And uh, that, you know, that's definitely intimidating. Um, uh, and then even sometimes when we're just parodying a direct, I mean that's where I get more intimidated. Is if I'm if I'm taking t aim at a director that I really love and uh, you know uh, admire, um, that's that's a scary thing as well because you sort of have this knowledge that they may see it. Uh, and so yeah, that's those are definitely uh, bigger moments. Hello, uh, my name is Saskia. Uh, I'm from New York. I go to the School of Visual Arts Film School. Hello. <laughs> um, so I was just wondering. Um, I, I didn't know this was like a genre, and I want to say it's hilarious. Uh, Drone has brilliant writing, and I'm interested Thanks. in screenwriting. And I also um, see that through satire, you can address controversial subjects, and um, people will laugh and um, not attack you for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was just wondering um, if that kind of ever um, crosses your mind when you're doing something maybe you know, there's like shots of Yemen, there's things happening in Mexico that people mm -hmm. love to joke about. Um, mm -hmm. Do you ever get nervous portraying something or do you kind of just get, um, I'm just curious oh, absolutely. how that process it's, is for you? No, it's definitely a concern. I mean, and, and, you know, I think, again, comedy is a difficult place because, again, satire is one thing, but, you know, well, yeah, when you making light of, of the cartel and what they're doing is not something we... It's not something I sort of rush into, like, oh, yeah, fuck the cartels, it's great. <laughs> uh, we definitely, you know, had a lot of discussions and, and sort of concerns about what we were doing. Um, but at the same time, we felt like it was right, you know, sort of the, this, that genre of documentary that, that Vice, you know, has really run with. We, we felt, you know, we felt like we were within our rights to sort of pursue it to that. Le you know, if we were going to do it, then this is the sort of, the ultimate um, sort of result of, of like what of their style, you know, it's, it's, it is always, you know, Vice always had this energy of, of like, yeah, we're here, it's dangerous, you know, like it's, it's more about the danger than about the story uh, sometimes. And so that, that was what we came at it from. But we definitely had fears, like, are we being blasé about this? Like, sh you know, should they die every, you know, act break? Um, and, uh, and we actually spoke to some, you know, to a f different, People, uh, you know, some in the doc world, and um, uh, we spoke to uh, Shaw, who made uh, Narco Cultura. I can't remember the last name now, but uh, it's a very good documentary about um, uh, narco uh, music uh, in, in Mexico. And uh, you know, again, people who'd been around it, and we were like, "Are we being, you know, is this?" <laughs> and and he was like, "No, like this is, you know, this is like right on. Like these guys, they are." <laughs> it was extreme. Take, it was taking extreme. things and running it with it in that way, and also they. We were also reassured that the cartel would enjoy it. <laughs> Hello, my name is Tiffany Evering. I'm from Clifton, New Jersey. Would you say that with experience or as you go along, there's like this moment sometimes when you're like, oh my goodness, this is going to be perfect, and it turns out to be so? Or would you say that the majority of the time it's like, this could be or it couldn't be, and then you're surprised by the, um, by the end mm -hmm. result? No, there's definitely moments where you, you know, you nail, you, you, 
take on a, a difficult shot and it happens, you know, like it, you pull it off. Um, I mean, that's always the goal, you know, like I never go into it sort of uh, on a 50-50 thing. You're I, definitely always the aim is to succeed. And so, yeah, there are moments when you, you I think that's my goal on SNL every week. And, and we've kind of, is that even though we've got this crazy time limit, I always, my goal going out every week is always to do something, and I'm literally only doing it for the people that work at the show and know the limitations, because I know a lot of the audience don't even know that we only shoot it in a day. But I want to do something that's going to sort of surprise people back at the studio, like, yeah, we, we did that shot, or we, you know, got that scale in, in that moment. Um, and so those, you know, when I do manage to do that, that's definitely a sort of feeling of, uh, of uh, pride. My question for you, you, you said you uh, got your show picked up for the next couple, next two seasons, which congratulations to you. Thanks. Um, so w when you're looking at the seasons ahead, I mean, you know, one challenge, of course, is to create a new show every week. But how do you plan something like this over the, an arc of a season? Does the show, the characters progress or do you make the same, reiterate the same premise over and over again with new characters and wigs and scenarios? Um, well, this show, uh, you know, what I love about it is that every episode is, is standalone. Um, so we, uh, we really can just, we, we've sort of opened up, I think, a, a, a fairly broad palette um, on it. So we, yeah, we, I don't think we have any sort of, I mean, there's no real arc we're pursuing, uh, I don't think, yet anyway. Uh, like the Al well, the Al Capone Festival episode we did, for example, I love the idea of just going back again next year and picking mm -hmm. it up as though it's just a year later and see what happened to those characters. It'd just be the slowest burn uh, <laughs> storyline ever. But um, but no, it's uh, now we're pretty open, and you know I think we're we've uh, we've this first season we've left the template to go to any time period and any genre. Um, so it's more of a like, sketch a sketch comedy show disguised it's kind of, as it's a, a just, documentary. Yeah, just each episode is twenty two minutes of. You know, a sing it's a single standalone film. Uh, so, um, yeah, each week you don't know what it's going to be. Um, so we have one episode that's, uh, you know, the Great Gardens one, which is um, ostensibly uh, in the 70s, and then uh, and then we've got the Thin Blue Line one, which is basically the 80s, and Drones is contemporary. We have one that spans 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we kind of we can do whatever we want. <laughs> hey, well, lots of luck and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thanks. How you doing? My name is Terrence. I'm a student here at NYIT. I'm also from Brooklyn. What is your perspective now compared to when you first started or why you do what you do? Even if uh, the new digital age actually took over, is there anything that may make you stop from doing what you do now? Uh, no, I don't think there's anything that will stop I mean I think the medium you know the fact that it's all digital and stuff is is or even that the movie's being shot on a cell phone and that's all good and exciting uh, and I've always sort of enjoyed that side of it um, uh, yeah I can't think of I, there's there's nothing that will change I don't think that would stop me from doing it anyway my in terms of my perspective uh, I guess I the thing when I started I was at the tail end of film like um, so I didn't really have this romantic uh, relationship with it uh, I was it was really thrilling to be sh seeing film being shot and, and working on it and to understand it um, and I'm glad that I have that experience of doing that but um, but I also I, I really love finding new formats and um, and new ways and using those to you know like in documentary now we shot a variety of different formats uh, just depending on the episode and we do that in SNL every week too I, I never it's not like oh I'm always going to shoot this way and with this thing I, I every week it's like if it's if it's one thing, I'll I'll shoot on a on an Alexa or another thing. I'll shoot on a Red. I've shot stuff on my cell phone as well. Um, uh, there's a lot of stuff in Blue Jean Community I shot on my cell phone. It's just if it's right, if it communicates the right style or the right language. Um, the Al Capone episode we shot on consumer home video cameras because we wanted it to feel just that little bit out of time and out of place. And and because um, it's funny, like now people are so used to seeing, so used to different qualities of what they see in terms of, you know, there's the Bravo sort of reality TV style and there's, you know, the more polished NBC, you know, drama. And, and you can kind of use those signifiers sometimes, whether it's the lighting style or the shooting format, to help take people a little further into the story without having to, you know, give them that exposition or whatever. You can, can just, kinda, they'll know it just you can communicate it. the genre yeah. and, and really quickly just by matching that 
look or that feel, and, and you can kind of load, you can load an audience up almost with some preconceptions about what they're seeing just based on mm -hmm. the way it looks. Well, that's it. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Thank today. you. And great. Thanks. Thanks.